good evening, dear friends. Uh, today's session is a little late uh, because the speaker today, Dr. Ella Varsi, she is uh, based in uh, Canada right now. And we thank her for sparing her time and taking uh, this all the way from Canada. So the topic today is acute bacterial meningitis, a very common problem. Uh, and uh, just to say a few words about uh, Dr. Ella Varsi's illustrious uh, career in such a young age. Uh, she is an uh, associate professor of neurology at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. She has 65 publications, several book chapters, and has been uh, invited uh, to several <laughs> national and international conferences. And her area of interest is movement disorders. So, <clears throat> Dr. Elavarsi, I hand it over to you. Please start the proceedings. Thank you, sir. Is the screen visible? Yes, yes, please, sir. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Tapesh for giving me this opportunity and all the participants for tuning into this channel at this late hour. Good evening, everybody. So uh, let me... Just a minute. So let me start this presentation uh, by giving an uh, outline. So infections of the central nervous system can have varying presentations. Uh, the commonest is the meningitis or encephalitis syndrome, which we will be discussing today in detail. Sometimes patients with bacterial infections might have, along with meningitis, a brain abscess. Some might have a stroke-like presentation or a spinal cord syndrome. So this will be the outline of my talk, uh, when to suspect, how to diagnose, and the perennial conundrum, whether to do the MRI or the CT scan first or the lumbar puncture first, and how to treat. So when do you suspect acute meningoencephalitis syndrome? So this is undergraduate teaching that meningitis is characterized by fever, headache, altered sensorium and neck stiffness. And encephalitis is characterized by seizures and focal deficits might or might not have headache and uh, other systemic features. But we should always remember that only 40% of the patients have all these clinical features. Whenever we talk about the uh, clinical features of something, we also should be interested in knowing the sensitivity and specificity of the signs and symptoms. Sensitivity, as we know in basic epidemiology, it is the symptom, if such a symptom is absent, then it rules out the diagnosis. But a specific symptom is one in which if the symptom is present, then it rules in the diagnosis. So for example, if you see here, in acute meningitis, if you take 100 patients, only 77 to 85% of them might have fever. This means that almost one-fourth to 15% of them might not have fever. Similarly, for headache also, you see the sensitivity is 79 to 94%. Neck stiffness might be present in only 83 to 94%. Altered sensorium in up to 83%. So if you say that fever, headache, neck stiffness and altered sensorium, all of them are essential or fever, headache and neck stiffness, which is called the classic triad of meningitis, all these three symptoms together are seen in only 44% of patients. So if we think that I will do CSF or I will do neuroimaging, only if the patient has neck stiffness. The patient, often we have, we see residents who are presenting on rounds saying that there is no neck stiffness, so it is unlikely to be meningitis. So we should be very careful of making such statements because if we don't do evaluate in such patients, we might be missing up to 50% or more of patients who have meningitis. So we should always, always remember that even if a patient has at least any two of the symptoms, then it is always a good idea to evaluate and err on the side of over-investigation rather than missing the diagnosis because missing a diagnosis of acute meningitis is going to be fatal for the patient. So if the patient has all three symptoms, very good, we are happy and we uh, go ahead with uh, further investigations and uh, urgent management. But even if the patient has two symptoms, then it is better to be on the safer side. So these are the myths and how to bust those myths. So meningitis is definitely characterized by these symptoms, but these are not always present and not all symptoms are necessary to perform a lumbar puncture and diagnose meningitis. And you should always have a low threshold for evaluation, especially in patients who are on analgesics, who are immunosuppressed, who are young, and those who are elderly. 
Then coming to chronic meningitis, whenever we speak about acute meningitis, I always keep this slide of chronic meningitis in the initial few slides. Because what happens is, often at times people say that acute meningitis is uh, from few hours to days, but chronic meningitis is meningitis which is present. I mean, the symptoms have been there for at least four weeks. So whatever is chronic was acute to begin with once upon a time. So we should never miss chronic meningitic syndromes like tuberculosis, especially in the ICU setting. In this uh, era of uh, easy availability of uh, immunosuppression and most of the patients that we do see, like for example, CKD patients who are having rheumatologic diseases, who are on immunosuppression drugs, and even patients on chemotherapy. These are the sort of patients that we see uh, these days in our intensive care setting. So uh, chronic meningitis may have a variable presentation, intermittent fevers, weight loss, appetite loss, night sweats, personality change, headaches, fluctuating symptoms. If these symptoms are there, we readily uh, suspect and diagnose chronic meningitis. But any meningitis which is lasting for more than few days, especially for five days or more, is characterized to be subacute or chronic. And etiologies of subacute and chronic meningitis often overlap. And we should always remember that acute bacterial meningitis, especially in the immunocompromised setting that I had detailed before, they, they can always present like a subacute presentation over five to seven days. So in such a situation, we should always be very careful. And tuberculosis in India is one of the most common causes of chronic meningitis, and it may present acutely also. Always, always remember, I will show you a case vignette which emphasizes this point. So whenever we consider a patient with acute fever, headache, and neck stiffness, and some altered sensorium drowsiness, so we always keep this in mind, whether it is an acute or an acute presentation of a chronic uh, illness. Though the chronic meningitis is considered to be more than four weeks, you may have a small subset of patients who have a very acute or a hyperacute presentation. And while talking about acute meningitis, bacterial meningitis is our topic of interest today. But we may also encounter viral meningitis, occasionally tubercular or syphilitic meningitis also may have an acute uh, uh, rapid fulminant onset. And parasitic infections like Negleria and Balamuthia also you should keep in the back of the mind so that you don't completely miss out on these techniques. Of course, we will start uh, treatment uh, for bacterial pathogens. We will not be thinking about uh, parasitic infections as the first go, but always keep that in the back of your mind whenever you are dealing with a acute meningitic syndrome. So let us just go through this case vignette. This was a very interesting case that I had encountered. So the 40-year-old lady with no comorbidities, she had presented to AIMS with a headache of 20 days, which was holocranial. And for the initial, in the initial one week only, she had undergone uh, CT head, which was told to be normal. But this patient was continuing to have severe intensity headache associated with vomiting. 13 days later, that is one week after the onset of this illness, the patient deteriorated in sensorium with irrelevant talking and she was not taking orally. The patient was evaluated, found some, was found to have some electrolyte abnormality. They corrected it and then they thought uh, everything was because of vomiting. But what happened? When she regained her sensorium, she was found to have a left eye ptosis as well as right eye impaired vision. But she was uh, uh, moving all four limbs, but she was still quadriparatic and not able to get up. So since this patient did not have any other uh, systemic uh, symptoms, constitutional symptoms, ear discharge, ENT complaints, no history to suggest any connective tissue disease, uh, people were considering what is this? This is some untreated, partially treated pyogenic meningitis or what is it? The patient did not have any other risk factors, no history of exposure to tuberculosis, no history of any IV drug abuse or other high risk behavior, no exposure to TB as well. When this patient was seen by us, she was conscious, she was obeying simple commands. She was oriented to person, but not to place or time. And we found paler and there were bilateral multiple cervical lymph nodes. And the rest of the examination was not very contributory. On examination, interestingly, this patient was found to have papilledema. So we have found two important signs. One was the uh, presence of uh, cervical lymphadenopathy. The second is bilateral papilledema, which is a very important sign that the patient is having raised intracranial pressure. And the pupils were uh, right pupil, was, since, uh, since I had already told you that there was a complete uh, third nerve palsy on the left side, there was anisocoria. 
and the left nasolabial fold was also less prominent. So, uh, important signs that we elicit in the uh, emergency department, like meningeal signs, neck rigidity, Kernig's and Brudzinski's sign were positive in this patient. So, what would we be thinking in such a patient? So, this patient had a like 20 day course with uh, uh, possibility of chronic meningitis with raised intracranial pressure was considered and other possibilities, non-infective causes like cerebral venous sinus thrombosis with cranial neuropathies, radiculopathies. Subarachnoid hemorrhage also can have such a presentation. We have this entity called uh, sentinel bleed in which the patient has initial headache and uh, altered sensorium followed by that the patient improves. Sometimes in subarachnoid hemorrhage also because of the uh, irritation of the meninges, you might have fever. Uh, sometimes the if there is involvement of the peripontine regions, then the patient might also have a central fever. So the presence of fever, headache, vomiting is not always due to meningitis and we should always keep other possibilities like for example subarachnoid hemorrhage which is a fatal diagnosis if it is missed because it needs emergent uh, neuroradiological or neurosurgical intervention. So you should always keep in mind these things even though you might uh, at the end of the day it, it might be a simple case of bacterial meningitis but if you miss this fatal diagnosis especially in this era of litigation we will be in for big trouble. So subarachnoid hemorrhage was also kept as a possibility. Uh, intracranial space occupying lesion with in increased intracranial Renal tension was also considered as one of the differentials, though in the initial initial uh, imaging was said to be normal. But uh, every time, whenever you, unless you see the films, you should always be wary. And uh, later on, sometimes patients with meningitis could also develop associated brain abscess. So you always keep these differentials in mind. So the patient underwent basic investigations. Uh, the hemogram was uh, essentially normal. CRP was slightly raised. And the uh, chest x-ray was also normal, Retro retroviral serology and other uh, markers, viral markers were negative. So you see the CT of the head that was done at the time of presentation. Uh, I will show you a normal CT later on, but if you see here, the cysts are completely obliterated, the ventricles are hardly seen. You see, there is chinking of the uh, lateral ventricles here, and in the upper cuts also, you hardly find the sulci all the sulci are effaced now the patient came to our emergency it was like 20 days we found this uh, cervical lymph nodes and papillary demand stuff like that so we did not go ahead with lumbar puncture immediately we started the patient with ATT and corticosteroids as well as levetiracetam because we thought the patient was at high risk of seizures now on the second or third day of presentation we got the ct scan done sorry mri done and the mri this is these are the t2 weighted images here you see the ventricles are still chinked but i will show you the uh, t1 images here you are th these are the plain t1 images these are the lateral ventricles which are still chinked the third ventricle is still chinked the flare images, in the flare images, we are able to see that the sulci have slightly opened up as compared to the very tightly packed sulcal spaces in the initial CT scan. So the steroids have obviously worked in this particular patient. But still you see that in the uh, sulcal spaces in the higher cuts, you still find some hyper intensities, meaning that there are some, uh, some infiltrates or some uh, pyogenic material that are placed within the sulcal spaces. So this is the contrast enhanced image, which are, which is the most important sequence that we uh, look at in patients who have suspected infection. So this is the midbrain. So around the midbrain, normally we find the dark CSF space. Here, due to contrast enhancement, the entire midbrain is enhanced, uh, encased by this uh, material that is within the subarachnoid space that we are able to see as enhancement, right? Also in the cerebral, in the uh, posterior fossa, in the infratentorial region also, we find a lot of enhancement here. So the CSF was done. Since the patient had started improving, we did the CSF. Uh, the opening pressure was more than 34. It was clear. The TLC was 500. You, you have to keep in mind this number, 500. Protein was elevated. Sugar was very low. 25 with the corresponding RBS of 133, VDRL India Inc was negative, malignant cytology was negative. So in this particular patient, why were we waiting for the lumbar puncture to be done two to three days after the CS uh, uh, patient got admitted? So we are always very much afraid of one thing, 
in acute care neurology, which is cerebral her herniation. So if there is herniation, then um, there is a very high risk of death of the patient. So that is the reason why lumbar puncture is avoided because lumbar puncture is um, historically thought to precipitate a cerebral herniation, brain herniation in a patient who has raised intracranial pressure. So what are the clinical features that we look for? See, because in classic literature, it is said if you suspect meningitis, then the first investigation is CSF, except in cases in which you suspect that there is very high risk of raised intracranial pressure. So there are some clinical risk factors for herniation. There are some imaging risk factors for herniation. If the patient is initially in stupor or coma, we have dilated or fixed pupils. If you have fixed eye deviation or absent oculocephalic reflexes, if you find papilledema, if the patient had a recent seizures, then there is a very high likelihood there is some parathymal lesion like a brain abscess or some tumor or something. And if you do a CSF lumbar puncture, then you might the patient might herniate. So if there is decorticate or decerebrate posturing, if you find some focal signs like hemiparesis or hypertension with bradycardia, which is a part of the Cushing triad, if these signs are present, then it is always a good idea, especially in the in this era of easy availability of um, imaging, it is a good idea to do imaging before doing the lumbar puncture. Now, after doing imaging, the, if you find certain features, like lateral shift of cerebral midline structures. For example, you find the pineal gland calcification that is shifted to one side. If there is loss of suprachiasmatic or basilar cisterns, like we had seen in our patient, we uh, if we have if we find obliteration or shift of the fourth ventricle, we had seen that in our patient the fourth ventricle was very chinked. And if we find that the superior cerebellar and quadrigeminal plate cisterns are obliterated, like we had in this patient. Masses in the cerebral hemisphere or cerebellum, supratentorial or infratentorial space occupying lesion. Or if there is any significant large infarcts, occlusion of superior sagittal sinus like cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. These are the imaging findings which will tell you, okay, it is better to wait. Don't do the CSF or lumbar puncture now. So let us have a short look at the systems at the base of the brain. For the intensivist, I think this is a very important slide. So in the uh, at the level of this ambient system, you find this uh, star-shaped structure. This is the ambient or the supracellular system. So this is the midbrain. At the level of midbrain, you are able to see the sylvian fissure. This is the midbrain, and we are able to see the sylvian fissure on both sides. So this is a patient. This is not the patient we had seen previously. This is an imaging of a normal patient. And a uh, patient with headache who did not have any uh, suspicion of raised intracranial pressure, you see the sylvian fissures are open. This is the supracellular system. You see nice black CSF within it. You see that around the midbrain, this is the perimesencephalic system. And this W shaped structure that you see here, this is called the uh, quadrigeminal plate system. So these structures, if they are very clearly visible, then these are signs that the intracranial pressure is not probably raised. So if, it, if these are obliterated, then they are signs that the patient probably has some raised intracranial pressure. Uh, so in the sagittal plane, you see, this is the superior cerebellar system. This is the quadrigeminal plate system. This is the peripontine system and this is the perimesencephalic system. So all these systems are very clearly seen and they are open. So this patient did not have any raised intracranial pressure. So uh, let us look at some studies which study the incidence of brain herniation in patients who had acute bacterial meningitis. So these are some old studies, uh, like in the 1960s, imaging was not widely available. MRI was hardly available in most of the clinical centers, and it was mainly used as a research tool. So in that era, unless the patient had some clinical features like papilledema or the signs that we had discussed previously, patients usually underwent lumbar puncture at the initial suspicion of meningitis. So if you see patients with meningitis, some of the studies have shown up to 25% of patients died due to herniation. And here, some of the uh, further recent studies showed that up to 1.8 to 8%. Or, and the total overall, if all the studies were taken into account, it was found that 5% of patients with acute bacterial meningitis died due to brain herniation. Now, we might wonder, okay, many of them did not undergo imaging. Had they undergone imaging, what else would have we done in a different manner? So this was another interesting study in which they did... 
CT scan and found what percent of patients either had brain herniation or who died due to brain herniation were detected on a CT scan. In other words, if imaging was done and you find that this imaging is normal, does that mean that if I do a lumbar puncture, this person is not going to herniate? So if you see here, some of these were very small uh, case reports. Patients who had even a normal CT scan actually herniate. In some of these studies, you see that up to 80% of patients who herniated had a normal CT scan. Here, 18, 43, 36% of patients who have normal CT scans also can herniate. But the point to remember is that if you find certain findings on either history or imaging, then it is better to wait rather than go, going ahead with the lumbar puncture. So the investigations that we commonly do in a patient who has suspected uh, meningitis is the first thing is CT, sorry, CT or MRI. And today's, uh, if it is available, you can do the MRI. But I think in the critical care setting, sometimes these patients, bacterial meningitis patients are agitated. They are in delirium and it might be very difficult to get an MRI scan done. So CT is the workhorse of our emergency department, at least at AIMS. So we recommend CT scan to be done in patients who had such red flags. And uh, uh, subsequently, if you find that the patient is a fit candidate to undergo lumbar puncture, then you can do CSF analysis. You always measure the opening pressure, you do the cell counts, differential counts. These have to be done immediately after the CSF has been tapped. So, cytology, protein, sugar, these are basic investigations. Then coming to the specific investigations for the diagnosis of acute bacterial meningitis, gram staining has to be done immediately and most of the centers these days have 24-7 microbiology uh, backup. And if you, if you think you are facing a patient with acute bacterial meningitis, you request the lab to do the gram staining immediately. The report can be available in five minutes over a phone call. It is a good idea to call up the uh, microbiologist to find that uh, report because finding a gram staining positive gram stain positive gives a 95 to 97 percent specific diagnosis and the patient has to be started on antibiotics appropriate to the grams if you find a gram positive cocci then you start vancomycin we will be coming to that later and uh, india ink staining also can be done pretty much quickly afb stain Coming to the gold standard diagnosis, culture, CSF culture is considered to be the gold standard. We will be looking at the details in a while. Blood cultures and other fluid cultures have to be done. If you find the patient has a pleural, pleural effusion, then you might do a pleural fluid tap. But blood culture is one of the initial investigations that have to be done. And uh, I would also like to remind you that if you think that the patient has some features of race acid, you are not able to do the lumbar puncture immediately. So before starting antibiotics, always, always take out at least a pad. 10 ml of blood cultures, at least two pairs of 10 ml of blood cultures and uh, immediately put them into the culture bottle and send it to the lab before starting antibiotics. It is always a good idea. You will never regret this. And uh, when you do the CSF, uh, obviously we will be sending for other molecular uh, tests. And uh, if we have, um, I mean, if you find some tissue or uh, structure to be biopsy like a lymph node, then it, you can go ahead with biopsy, but these are not emergency investigations. So, coming to the third myth, in raised ICT syndrome, lumbar puncture is contraindicated. This was a myth, but LP is better avoided when there is unequal pressure in the supra and infratentorial compartments or in either cerebral hemisphere. Or if you, for, for example, if in, in the syndrome of uh, raised intracranial uh, pressure due to IAH, we do the lumbar puncture. In fact, lumbar puncture is considered to be a treatment. You must have uh, read about cryptococcal meningitis. In cryptococcal meningitis also, lumbar puncture, repeated therapeutic lumbar puncture to keep the uh, CSF pressure less than 25 is recommended as a treatment. So raised intracranial pressure alone is not a contraindication for doing a lumbar puncture. But keeping in view the other features that we had seen previously, we should be careful in doing the lumbar puncture and explain the risks to the patient. But in many times to attain a definitive diagnosis, you might need a lumbar puncture still. So how to approach? In acute meningitis, time is the key. We need to act fast. 
In chronic meningitis, the timeline will give you the clues. General examination is always important. Always look for rashes and lymph nodes. Ocular examination is also important. If you have a fundoscope, you can look at the choroidal tubercles. You should obviously will be looking for papilledema, but for giving getting a specific diagnosis, if you find choroidal tubercles in a patient with acute bacterial meningitis, you will probably prefer to start ATT on day one. Find cells in anterior chamber, uveitis. Uh, they may be present in infective or non-infective conditions. For example, sarcoid meningitis also can present like a fulminant presentation. And um, lymphoma sometimes can present in such a manner. Retinal vasculitis, CMV retinopathy. If these findings are there, then you might think consider starting gancyclovir on day one. So these are findings that should, you should always be in the lookout for. And systemic evaluation, obviously, we all know that as internists, um, we often find other other uh, clinical findings on systemic examination. And when empirical therapy is uh, offered, especially when evaluation, initial evaluation is non-revealing, when the patient is rapidly deteriorating or sometimes as a diagnostic aid. So let us uh, talk about one more myth. We often feel that in bacterial meningitis, uh, the cell counts are very high. And in chronic meningitis, is too, like tubercular, it is quite on the lower side. So it is a myth that cell counts and differentials can differentiate various forms of meningitis. So I will make it very simple for you. If you find the cell count to be in thousands, that is commonly in bacterial meningitis. If the count is 5,000, 10,000 in that range, then it is invariably bacterial. But in a bacterial meningitis, the cells can also be on the lower side in hundreds. If it is in 100, 100 to 500 cells, then it can be anything. It can be bacterial, it can be mycobacterial, it can be syphilitic, it can be viral or non-infective forms of meningitis also. The other important thing that we should remember is, it is often said that if the patient has a neutrophilic pleocytosis, then it is bacterial. If the patient has a lymphocytic pleocytosis, then it is tubercular. This is also a commonly taught dictum, especially in undergraduate teaching, this is what is taught. Neutrophilic hair, then you start antibiotics. If it is lymphocytic, okay, start ATT with steroids. No. A patient with bacterial meningitis, 15% of them might have lymphocytic predominance in CSF. Similarly, in the initial stages of chronic meningitis, like tubercular meningitis, the patient can have a neutrophilic presentation. So apart from positive gram staining, there is no other parameter that differentiates bacterial meningitis from fungal or tubercular meningitis. If you find gram staining positive, then you are safe. That also you should be careful because sometimes it might be a contaminant or some other cause. But 97% of the times, if we find gram staining to be positive, it is invariably bacterial. But if you don't find gram staining in the emergency department, you always keep the other options, possibilities open and always explain to the patient and the caregivers that we are suspecting bacterial meningitis, but rest of the workup is in the pipeline. So we will start antibiotics. Let us wait and watch. You, We cannot just say that this is, okay, this is bacterial only and nothing else. This sort of uh, sweeping statements we cannot make because of the limitations in the diagnostic armamentarium that we have today. So what are the specific diagnostic tests to be done to determine the bacterial etiology? Now, as we already discussed, the CSF appearance might be cloudy, might be clear also. That depends on the uh, significant concentration of the WBCs, RBCs, bacteria and protein. So if you have, if the patient has come to you on day one or day two and you have done the CSF, you may find the CSF to be clear. But if the patient comes at a later stage in a very moribund condition, then it might be cloudy. If it is cloudy, then you may you may confidently think, okay, it is something infective only, either it is tubercular or bacterial. But if it is clear, you are not going to rule out a diagnosis of bacterial meningitis. Untreated bacterial meningitis, as I told you, the count is usually elevated, usually in the range of thousands. But the counts can be as low as 100 also. It can be more than 1 lakh also. If it is more than 1 lakh, then often we keep a... If it is very high, we think it is probably leukemia, lymphoma or something. But it can still be bacterial meningitis as well. And as I told you, acute bacterial meningitis, usually it has a neutrophil predominance in 80 to 95 percent. But up to 10 percent of patients may have a lymphocytic predominance and lymphocyte predominance means more than 50 percent lymphocytes in the CSF. So lymphocytic predominance does not rule out a 
bacterial etiology of meningitis. If you have a patient who has presented on day two or day three, don't just start anti-tubercular therapy based just on this lymphocytic predominance and skip giving antibiotics. Then you may be making a committing a very big mistake. The CS of glucose concentration is less than 40 milligram in up to 60% of the patients. But the case that I showed you in that patient, the CS of uh, glucose was 25. But that patient had tubercular meningitis. That patient also had an initial, uh, in within one week, the patient had become extremely ill. That patient did not have bacterial meningitis. That patient had tubercular meningitis. So just based on the CSF cell count, sugar, protein, you cannot reliably differentiate a bacterial from a tubercular meningitis. So on day one, when the patient comes to the ED, always, if you have done the CSF, get the gram staining immediately. And then the uh, CSF, coming to the CSF culture, which is considered to be the gold standard, they are positive in 70 to 85 percent of the patients. So, if it is a gold standard, then why it is negative in still 32 to 15 to 30 percent of patients? That is because these days we have a lot of availability of antibiotics. If any patient who has some fever, they pop in some antibiotic pills. So, that is the reason why CSF culture might be negative. And second, we should also remember that. Uh, if the patient uh, if the um, patient is in a very bad shape, we cannot wait for the cultures because the cultures might take up to 48 hours for the organism to be identified. So in the meanwhile, you do the gram staining and it has a specificity of 97%, though you should always remember that the sensitivity might be quite low. And because of that, you cannot just say a gram stain is negative, so uh, I will not start antibiotic. That is not how you do it. If you have a strong suspicion based on the clinical findings, based on the imaging, based on other uh, features, on um, uh, other features like uh, uh, the presence of in an epidemiologic situation in an epidemic like state, then you may start antibiotics even in the absence of a gram stain, even if the gram stain is negative. So, coming to the most uh, sought after investigation these days, the CSF, uh, PCR, and the biofire panels. So, PCR has been utilized to amplify DNA from uh, DNA or from the patient with meningitis, and sometimes an RNA virus is also the uh, RNA can be amplified. Some of the studies have shown a sensitivity and specificity of more than 90%. In one study in which uh, common meningitis organ causing organisms like Neisseria and H. influenzae, Streptococcus, these were studied, the sensitivity was studied to be 94 and specificity was 96. And some of the studies have shown even a sensitivity of 100% and specificity of 98. So what does this mean? This means that if there is a patient who has acute meningitis syndrome and you send a biofire panel, you find something to be positive, then there is a very high likelihood that it is really positive. So that will help you in starting the initial antibiotic therapy and tailoring the antibiotic therapy as well. But if it is negative, then be careful. You need to consider the other picture also. Maybe if it is, um, if the clinical suspicion is very strong, and you can start antibiotics and wait for the uh, status, how the status proceeds. But if it is positive, then definitely you can start antibiotics based on, uh, I mean, based on the particular organism that you identify, you can give even a targeted therapy for antibiotic. Then coming to procalcitonin. So procalcitonin, the role of procalcitonin here, especially in the setting of bacterial, acute bacterial meningitis is to help you differentiate between a bacterial meningitis and a viral meningitis. For example, like a herpes simplex or some other uh, viruses. For example, in the enteroviral uh, epidemic season, you may have enteroviral uh, encephalitis. So in such a situation, if the procalcitonin, serum procalcitonin level is elevated, then it might be a useful marker to differentiate bacterial from viral meningitis as a cutoff of at a cutoff of 0.2 nanogram per ml. But some of the studies have uh, shown false negative results. Uh, sensitivity is just 70%, but if it is positive, if procalcitonin is more than 0.2, then there is a fairly uh, good likelihood that we are dealing with the patient of bacterial meningitis rather than viral meningitis. So when to administer the antibiotics? So 
answer seems to be very simple as soon as possible you administer the antibiotics the problem occurs in patients when there are cases of litigation for example a patient presents to uh, presents to you with a uh, uh, three to five days uh, history of uh, fever headache and all that sense of then you start antibiotics and unfortunately if the patient doesn't do well or uh, if the patient develops some complications the family might make an allegation that okay the antibiotics were started late it though you were you started antibiotic on the day one of you when you saw the patient but the patient had not been treated for the initial 3 to 5 days so is this a problem so these studies were initially performed because most of the uh, in the us settings when the uh, when there was litigation that there was negligence on behalf of the physician then the lot of literature search was done It was found that in uh, in twenty two studies were reviewed and almost four, four, four almost five thousand patients were studied. It was found that the duration of symptom before the initiation of antibiotic therapy, two things were seen. One was the duration of symptoms. Other was the uh, tempo and the significant severity of the illness. So, if the patient has some generalized malaise, fever, some loss of appetite, even if there is a delay of three to five days. there was no significant alteration in the uh, outcomes like risk of sequelae or death if the patient had a extremely fulminant presentation patient developed headache fever altered sensor within few hours whether you start the antibiotics within the first 6 hours or whether you start after a few days that was also not having any relation to the outcome but in patients who have clinically avert meningitis even a delay of 1 hour incrementally increase the risk of permanent injury so we should remember that if the patient is doing mild mild symptoms then always it is a good idea to start the antibiotics as soon as possible if i have a patient who comes into my ed and i have a suspicion of meningitis i first thing i will do the blood cultures then i may consider whether to do ct first or csf first that dilemma will be in my mind but once i take out the blood cultures if i have any delay inordinate delay in doing the lumbar puncture i will start antibiotics but in fulminant patients even if you start antibiotics you might not be able to change the outcome and the communication with the patient family especially in the intensive care setting that will avoid these problems but always remember start antibiotics as soon as possible so what do we start how do we treat in patients adult patients that we deal with routinely uh, in the 2 to 50 year age groups the commonest bacterial pathogens are neisseria meningitis and streptococcus pneumoniae in such a situation what do we treat with we treat with vancomycin and a third generation cephalosporin why vancomycin many of the studies have found that streptococcus pneumoniae are inherently resistant to penicillins penicillins as well as methicillins so in a disease like uh, fulminant disease like meningitis which can have fatal consequences we don't want to play around trying various antibiotics and looking for the response we start with the highest form of uh, highest antibiotic possible so that we don't miss out subsequent uh, along with that we give a third generation cephalosporin like a cefotaxime or a ceftriaxone subsequently you find that the gram stain report has uh, shown something or if the culture has shown something then you step down if you find that the organism is sensitive to methicillin then it is a good idea to give cloxacillin or flucloxacillin rather than giving vancomycin but the first step is giving vancomycin plus third generation cephalosporin wait for the cultures then step down this is not a uh, like in the standard icu setting you first start with some antibiotic cephalosporin then you go to uh, piperacillin tazobactam then if it is not responding we go to colistin in meningitis we don't have that pattern we start with vancomycin then step down if we find something on culture then in in a specific setting when you are suspecting listeriosis or aerobic gram negative bacilli then you can add ampicillin also along with vancomycin and third generation cephalosporin especially in the older age group more than 50 years uh, as we commonly see we we find lot of geriatric patients these days because of the increased life expectancy in india so it is a good idea to add ampicillin as well now what to do do we give steroid or we don't often in the uh, in in our uh, medicine we are being taught that steroid is a immunosuppressant suppressant agent so in a patient who is having 
uh, suspected infection also if you suspect infection then better don't give steroids but these are certain indications like fulminant life threatening situations especially in the uh, presence of significant meningeal inflammation in the presence of giving steroids help so this has been demonstrated in various studies initially there was a lot of dilemma there were some studies which were uh, for giving dexamethasone some against the study results were inconclusive then subsequently i think in 2002 there was a um, a randomized control trial that was published in the New England Journal and it was found that the patients who received dexamethasone prior to uh, administration of antibiotics there was significant improvement in uh, significant reduction in the risk of development of sequelae or death. So the p-values were significant as you see here unfavorable outcome was seen in 15 percent of the patients who received dexamethasone as compared to 25 percent of patients in patients with uh, all forms of meningitis and especially in patients with pneumococcal meningitis the risk was reduced by almost uh, uh, i mean 50 percent like 26 percent versus 52 percent death was also reduced like from 34 percent in patients who did not receive the dexamethasone to 14 percent so dexamethasone is not like a magic bullet it is not going to save every patient but it definitely reduces the risk of uh, sequelae like uh, deafness, uh, significant morbidity, or uh, even it reduces the risk of death in patients who have all forms of meningitis. And if the patient has pneumococcal meningitis, then uh, the benefits are even higher. So in all the groups, dexamethasone was, uh, all the group means patients who have meningococcal, sorry, uh, pneumococcal meningitis versus other forms of meningitis. Patients who have uh, moderate to severe uh, drop in Glasgow coma scale, these were the patients who had the maximum benefits. So a patient who has who is uh, having fever, headache, neck stiffness, but not in altered sensorium, might not have as high as a benefit, but it is still worthwhile to give dexamethasone in all patients in whom we suspect uh, bacterial acute bacterial meningitis because they have been shown in randomized control trials to reduce the risk of sequelae or death. So uh, two things that I would like to po point out before finishing my talk and opening the house for discussion. Uh, headache, fever, focal signs and seizures might uh, might herald the development of brain abscess. So, for example, you have started antibiotic treatment in a patient. The patient was initially improving for two days, then you were confident about the diagnosis. Later on, the patient develops worsening of headache, the fever is persistent, and patient develops seizures. So, it is a good idea to repeat imaging to find out if the patient has developed complications of meningitis like a brain abscess, especially in the setting of heart disease, infective endocarditis, skull defects or fractures, uh, middle ear problems, especially in children and adolescents, IV drug users, immunocompromised states, as we see a lot of patients who are on uh, TNF blockers and other forms of immunosuppression. Uh, we often use rituximab and other uh, uh, B cell ablative therapies uh, in uh, both neurologic settings, immunologic settings, as well as in oncologic settings. So we should always keep in mind if the patient is developing other complications. And sometimes other uh, mm, uh, fungi can also, from the ICU setting, uh, you may have a fungal brain abscess because of other complications related to central lines, IV lines, other catheters, tubes, etc. And sometimes the patients might have a stroke. After you have started treatment, the patient might develop hemiparesis. And you should always think whether am I dealing with the vasculitis due to, um, due to infective vasculitis or whether it is due to something like an immune-mediated reaction, angioinvasion, vascular inflammation, leaky blood vessels. Has my patient developed mycotic uh, aneurysms? Um, the, the stroke-like presentations can also occur in other forms of meningitis like syphilitic tubercular meningitis is notorious to cause uh, vasculitic infarcts and HIV, zoster vasculitis also should keep in mind though you have made a diagnosis. of See, many times what happens is uh, herpes zoster can be precipitated. The patient might have had a past history of chickenpox and when the patient has an acute fever, acute meningitic illness, the patient can have reactivation of zoster. So that can also lead to 
zoster vasculitis and the treatment might you might have to modify the treatment you might have to add acyclovir you might have to add high dose of supraphysiologic doses of steroids rather than being dogmatic okay i got gram positive cocci on csf this is only tuber uh, sorry only bacterial meningitis that sort of dogmatism will not work in the intensive care setting you should always keep your eyes ears and all senses open always keep various differential diagnosis uh even if it is lower down then you think okay the settings have changed the patient has developed new symptoms am i missing something am i overlooking something or is there a dual pathology all these things you need to consider especially cmv and ebv can get reactivated in patients who have um, bacterial meningitis also so uh, these are the specific care but uh, obviously the supportive care that the intensive pro intensive care and the intensivists provide are paramount ventilation nutrition electrolytes and sugar management temperature management dvt prophylaxis stress ulcer prophylaxis all these are very important and of course you as intensivists are expert in this field more than we are so it is always a team work the team work between the uh, critical care team the Uh, general team in internal medicine team as well as the neurologist team that are paramount in bringing out the best outcomes for our patients so let us finish off the seminar with some take home points any acute or subacute presentation may be infectious in etiology especially in the tropical countries absence of fever or other systemic symptoms may not be a reliable marker to rule out infections and we should keep a low threshold for suspicion of meningitis especially acute bacterial meningitis and the patient should be investigated thoroughly and systematically thank you uh, uh, thank you dr elrovici for such a nice presentation please uh, stop, stop the share screen uh, so thank you sir yeah uh, if you have any questions from the audience please put up the question meanwhile we'll just discuss a few things <clears throat> I've jotted down a few points. Uh, first of all, I would just like to share one case and the uh, stress the importance of PCR. You know, we had this patient, sixty-year-old uh, lady, COPD. She came in with COPD exacerbation, and she was on the ventilator. <clears throat> we treated her for that, and then she was having uh, already deranged renal function. She developed uh, AKI. She developed portent sensorium in uremic encephalopathy. And we dialyzed her, but she was not improving. So mm -hmm. I did do a CSF. CT was normal. We did a CSF. There was some cell elevation. Uh, we sent the PCR, and the PCR showed H influenza. The oh. and we mm -hmm. started ceftriaxone, and within 48 hours, a GCS from three four became almost normal. Mm -hmm. Just uh, stress the importance of things like PCR, which is really there at times. And uh, yeah. Where the H flu came from was that the H flu was the exacerbation in the COPD, and then there was some mm. and seeding. So, yes, yes. So sometimes I think PCR is really helpful. It's a little costly, but definitely mm. if you pick up things otherwise which you may not pick up. It's very difficult at times. True. Then uh, other couple of comments I like to make is the CSF sugar. You know, often people are given uh, IV bolus sugar. Sometimes sugars are low. It takes time for the blood sugar in the uh, the blood sugar to come in equilibrium with the CSF sugar. You know, it takes a few hours. So whenever yes. CSF glucose ratio to the blood glucose ratio, one should be aware of this fact. You know, because yes. 0.4 is a sensitive marker for showing acute bacterial meningitis. But if you are given glucose uh, just a few hours. Mm -hmm. The glucose measurement, then that ratio has to be taken into consideration. Uh, Absolutely true. Yeah. Then uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, you know, about uh, steroids. So I just wanted to ask you, Doctor Lavarsi. Uh, you know, there have been some trials from Africa and uh, Southeast Asia, which have shown that steroids do not uh, show any improvement. The trials which show improvement have come from the uh, the more industrialized countries. And they have said that probably because the patient come late, they have more complications, they have debilitating conditions. So what is and in fact this is there in the recent edition of Harrison also. So in the yes. groups, uh, so should be in India, you know, we we are a resource limited country. So steroids hold too for our uh, setting. Uh, sir, that is a difficult question to answer because we in India do not have any randomized controlled trials, and uh, often we are like stuck between the. We are not as 
as uh, resource limited as the African countries. And the African countries, the the criticism for those studies which showed negative effect of steroids was predominantly most of the patients, especially these studies were done in children and most of them had associated HIV infection. So that was a strong confounder. And uh, coming to the randomized control trials that was published in 2000 two in NEJM, they included a wide spectrum of patients and they included patients who had immunocompromised. Like, they were like a lot of similar, those patients had the clinical features, especially the baseline characteristics were quite similar to the patients that we deal at least in our uh, tertiary hospital settings. So uh, I would say that th then there was another negative trial of uh, steroids in patients who had cryptococcal meningitis in whom I think that study was published in the late, uh, I mean, early 2011 or 12 or so. So keeping in mind these uh, things, if the patient has retroviral serology positive, then the benefit that we offer by adding steroids might be very low. But in day one, when the patient comes into the emergency, we might not have all this information at hand. So based on the guidelines, the guidelines say that you start the patient on, if you have a suspicion of bacterial meningitis, you start the patient on steroids at least 15 to 20 minutes before administering the first dose of antibiotics. And then subsequently, you may uh, you may tailor the treatment for if you find that the patient has cryptococcal meningitis, obviously stop. If you find the patient has uh, uh, HIV serology positive, then obviously you may consider stopping it. But by and large, most of the patients benefit by adding of uh, corticosteroids in patients who have acute bacterial meningitis. Good, nice. Okay, then what about the role for repeat CSF or dialysis? So repeat CSF, uh, if the patient is definitely improving, then uh, you may you may not consider it. But uh, occasional patients in whom you had an initial diagnosis of acute bacterial, acute bacterial meningitis, by definition, you start the first dose of antibiotics. Within few hours, a patient who was comatose gets up and uh, becomes conscious. And that, that is the dramatic sort of improvement that we expect. So if we don't have such a sort of improvement, you may do... A CSF either to have a revise your diagnosis or to get a, a repeat cultures or other investigations to be done. In such a situation, repeat CSF is definitely recommended, but not as a routine just to see, like we do a chest x-ray after pneumonia, okay, we do a chest x-ray and see whether the patch has gone away. CSF is not done in that sort of settings just to uh, just to document recovery. Yeah, so a failure to improve in 72 hours would uh, warrant a repeat CSF, right? Yeah, 48 to 72 hours, yes. And I think the glucose uh, is the most important thing there. Whether the glucose is improving or not uh, would be the most important thing. Glucose as well as cell counts, sir. Cell counts also. Okay. Yeah. What about the role for uh, uh, doripenem? You know, we use sometimes meropenem in bacterial meningitis. So mm -hmm. meningitis, you know, there's imipenem, there's doripenem, and there's meropenem. So imipenem is uh, highly epileptogenetic, so we don't use epipenem, but meropenem is less. But doripenem almost has no seizure causing potential. So any experience in your center with use of doripenem instead of meropenem in patients who may require, for example, neurosurgical patients or some other settings? Uh, personally, sir, I don't have experience in using doripenem. In our uh, ICU, we, we, even in the neurosurgical setting, we use meropenem only. I, I have absolutely no experience in using doripenem at times. Okay. And just the last thing we'll discuss, what are, what are the uh, you know uh, situations where the patient may not improve? in the meningitis. There can be complications, resistance, etc. So you would like to talk a little about that? If the patient is not in meningitis? Yeah, I will talk about that. But before that, uh, since you mentioned the epileptogenic potential of meropenem, I would just add one, one another point. A patient who is receiving uh, valproic acid if there is uh, if you add meropenem then the patient uh, the level of valproate may go down and the patient may develop a seizure so a patient who is receiving valproate you always be careful when you are administering meropenem especially in the icu settings so i wanted to tell uh, this point. Meropenem yeah 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 the other thing that you were asking was what was what were the causes of non-response right yes. yeah so the the commonest cause of non-response is uh, inad inadequate uh, dose of the uh, antibiotics and uh, especially some situations, for example, if the patient is undergoing dialysis 
dialysis or other stuff we are giving vancomycin and vancomycin is getting dialysed and we need to be quite careful in such situations and it is always a good idea to do do therapeutic drug level monitoring in such cases and the second cause is like uh, inappropriate antibiotics for example if the patient is having a uh, you started the patient on uh, ceftriaxone and vancomycin, but the patient's culture report has not yet come and you find that ultimately the patient was having some gram-negative cause of meningitis and the, and the particular organism is resistant to these antibiotics. So these are the important causes and suppose if the patient doesn't improve within 48 hours, then it is always a better idea to start meropenem or you step up depending on the availability of culture results. Often at times we find that at least in our AIM setting, most of the times the cultures turn out to be negative. So in that situation, we just try and look around, are we missing a diagnosis? Is it something viral or something tubercular that we are, we initially started the treatment with anti-tubercular drugs. So you go back, look at the history, look at other investigations like chest x-ray. Uh, if you are not able to find anything and the patient is deteriorating, sometimes on day two, day three, we go ahead and get the PET scan done. And often at times we have found that the patient in fact had uh, tubercular or the, the one one case which I remember very well was during my residency that patient had a malignancy in the gallbladder and that was a carcinomatous meningitis. So generally by and large acute bacterial meningitis improves within the first 48 hours. If they don't improve either you have to uh, your uh, your diagnosis has to be revised or more commonly like the, there is some drug interaction going on some other uh, uh, something else like uh, the therapeutic drug is not reached or you are giving some antibiotic which is which the organism is inherently resistant to then the other thing was like the structural things that we had discussed about if the patient develops a vasculitic infarct in strategic areas for example if the patient develops a infarct of the brain stem, then the patient might not improve that is not the patient of course has a meningitis acute bacterial meningitis but the patient has developed some complication Similarly, someone who has a brain abscess. Brain abscess is like operable. You can operate and take it out. But if the patient has uh, infarcts, large infarcts due to vasculitis, then the patient is unlikely to improve. So the, then you also have this one subgroup of uh, fulminant meningitis, like whatever you do, the patient, uh, patient does not respond. So they are unfortunate situations, but... These are the reasons of non-response. So, what about status epilepticus? Is it common in meningitis, acute meningitis? No, sir. Actually, by status, status. Yeah. non-convulsive status is quite difficult to diagnose. Even if you find features of the slowing and stuff on electroencephalography, and uh, acute bacterial meningitis is not a common cause of status epilepticus. Sometimes, for example, if you if the patient is getting some some drug like uh, imipenem, miropenem, even vancomycin can cause precipitate seizures. But um, by and large, acute bacterial meningitis is not commonly complicated by status epilepticus. But if the patient develops status, then it should be treated like any other status. I think uh, that's very nice, uh, Dr. Lavarsi. Thank you so much. There are no questions from the audience. So we will put this up on our channel for uh, further viewership. Thank you so much. Have a good time in Canada. All the best. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity.